We're now going to move on to section 12.3 of chapter 12 of the book Data Driven Science and Engineering. Brian Kutz, here's the website, databookuw.com. And in this section, what we're going to talk about is our first principled architecture for sampling a, a high dimensional system with some R number of interpolation points or sensor locations. So the idea here is to come up with an architecture for us to build our reduced order models in an efficient way. Now remember the reduced order model is about taking high dimensional state space, figuring out a low dimensional subspace that's an accurate representation of that high dimensional space, building our dynamical models in this low dimensional subspace, R dimensions, and then having a surrogate model or proxy model that's much quicker to run so we can do simulations much cheaper. So again, here's the construct. I just want to remind everybody that this is what we're after. We're after solving some PDE, some high dimensional state space that went under, discretization, under discretization becomes in fact a high dimensional ODE system. As a linear part, nonlinear part, we want to project into a subspace of the POD modes. And this is the equations of motion in that subspace for the A. Everything here is easy to handle. So for instance, even the linear operator can be constructed once up front. So you do these inner products, this becomes an R by R matrix. So that's low dimensional. But then here's where the problem lies is that the nonlinearity itself generates a problem for you because doing this nonlinearity, evaluating the nonlinearity requires you to go back up to the full dimensional state space to take inner products in that space and then drop it down again, which means you haven't saved anything if you have to do those inner products of these high dimensional state spaces. So the idea is how do we set up an interpolation architecture to effectively and rapidly evaluate this, these nonlinear inner products by using a small number of points, which can be used as a proxy measurement for representing the high dimensional inner product interpolation. So sparse sampling and interpolation, this is kind of where we've gone, where we've gone with this and I've talked about the GAPI POD method which was exactly this idea of from this high dimensional subspace if I want to reproduce, uh, reconstruct that function in some uh, support space of the measurements then, then you can what, what the GAPI POD architecture allows you to do is set up the interpolation format for doing exactly that with a limited number of measurements. Now what GAPI did is typically said, well, okay, so here's the idea, right? So take some measurement matrix P on the full n-dimensional subspace, state space to produce a subspace representation U tilde, which is R-dimensional. And the measurement matrix itself are, uh, are rows of the identity. In other words, it tells you which points that wherever you're going to measure in some point, there's a one there and zero everywhere else. So you have R measurements. So it's going to be R locations here. R, R rows of the identity matrix are going to show up here. Okay, and now that's what we're going to use as our matrix template for multiplication of taking you from the high dimensional space space to the low dimensional state space. The question was about how do we determine P? In other words, how do we determine these sensor locations? So Gappy suggested just basically uh, using random points because I want to do the best job though reconstruction. I want to figure out how to do I do the best job in reconstructing this, uh, this representation which means I need to figure out the A tilde and what Gappy did was just said let's just randomly sample our locations and what we want to do is start thinking about a principled way to do this and the first one that was out there was by Karen Wilcox, and I want to highlight this work because it was the first to sort of start setting up an infrastructure for a principled way to think about this interpolation architecture. Okay, and what we talked about before was uh, we looked at the error and we looked at also the condition number of this measurement subspace or the support space of the measurements. In fact, one of the key indicators was that when the uh, when you look at the, this measurement subspace or the support space of this, this M matrix that we computed before with GAPI POD, uh, the condition number was one in the ideal case and it went to essentially infinity when you do really poorly. 
So the idea is then to take this condition number and try to minimize it. This is exactly what Wilcox proposed is to say, let's come up with an algorithm to go figure out how do we minimize the condition number. And in so doing, we probably will be able to select good sparse sensing locations. Okay. So here's how the algorithm works. It's pretty simple. Place a sensor. We know there's an interpolation point. Uh, and what you do to do this is the first thing you do is you search at every single point. You ask, if I measure at this point, what's the condition number? If I measure at this point, what's the condition number? That's my support and that's my support, what's the condition number? So you walk through all possible locations. Whoever has the lowest condition number, you say, that's my sensor location. You do it again. Now that you take that out, you say now, I'm looking for a second sensor location, so I walk through all possible points and see which one gives me the lowest condition number, take that out. Third, fourth, and you place all the sensors this way. Very simple, but somewhat expensive, right? Because you have to compute the condition number n times. And then you take a sensor out. Then you compute the condition number n minus one times. So, okay. Uh, so it's expensive, but it's nice in the sense it has all the right philosophy for us to take a step forward for understanding how to do good sensor location. So for instance, I want to go back to here, which is the harmonic oscillator. We're going to use this again throughout the examples we've done. So here's what the modes look like. This is like my POD basis I'm going to use as an exemplar. And here are some just random measurements of that basis. But we want to move away from randomness, right? We, we, we already talked about randomness in the last lecture. And now I want to talk about, yeah, so let's, let's be principled about how we place these sensors down instead of just randomly pick some locations. So here's how it works. I'm going to go ahead and just do it. So here are 81 points. And what I'm going to do is for every single point, suppose I put first time through, there's no sensors. I have one sensor location. I put it down and I put it, put it down first in the first location. I compute a condition number. Put it down in the second location. Put it computer condition number. In fact, I do it for all possible 81 points where I'd put this. And what I notice is the lowest condition number is right there, right where that blue is. So what I do is say, okay, that's the lowest condition number. I pull it out. I will now have an interpolation point or sensor location right there. Now that it's out, I take that sensor location and plus one other. And then I scan the other one could be here or here, or here, and I compute the condition number again. Scan through all possibilities, and I find the lowest number is right there. I pull that out. Do it again. There's the third location. There's the fourth location. So you see how this works? You're just going to basically scan through. It's expensive, but it does the job because now I'm actually finding ways to push that condition number further and further down for every sensor that I add. So here's what happens as I start going through this process and picking sensors. Here's the log of the condition number. So the first sensor, it's still pretty big condition number. And as I go through here, all of a sudden it falls off a cliff at 10 iterations, which makes sense because in fact, I have 10 SVD, uh, 10 POD modes. So as soon as I have the number of sensors matches my number of modes, and all of a sudden my error just drops precipitously here right to here, and then I start to iterate here. So I start improving, but really, at 10 centers, I'm doing quite well. In fact, here's what the error does. If I look at the log of the error, right here is a drop, okay? And what I'm showing you here at the bottom is as I go from iteration zero to 20, these are the sensors that come on. So the first sensor to come on is right here, okay? It comes on first. Then the second sensor comes on here. Then the third comes on here and so forth. So it's basically showing as I iterate forward, which sensors come on at which iteration. So I like this graph in the sense it tells you which sensors turn on. So this is very different strategy than just randomly sampling, right? This is all about thinking about the structure of the data and the modes you're using find the best locations to put an interpolation point so it gives you the most accurate reconstruction possible. And this is at least one strategy to do that and you can see how the sensors come on accordingly.
And by the way, here's the reconstruction of the test function we've been working with using those uh, harmonic oscillator modes. So the test function is right here in front. It's two Gaussians. And here's my reconstruction as a, from iteration 1 to iteration 20. So it's awful all the way until about iteration 10. In fact, here you go. I give you a blow up of this region. Um, at iteration 9, it's not well. And at iteration 10, it falls right onto the test function. It looks like the test function. So fantastic. It shows you that, hey, you do very well if you prick these principal locations. If you had done random locations with 10 sensors, you would not do nearly as well. Of course, you could randomly have picked one that does well, but the average and the variance are very high if you're only having 10 locations. So this is a really nice way to do this. So now, it, it, it highlights two things. If you use principal sensor placement or principal interpolation points, you can use fewer than you would necessarily, than you would probably use doing random. Okay, so that's an important consideration. So, but but you pay a cost for it, right? You have to run this algorithm. However, if you if you have if it's easy enough for you to just add sensors, then you could almost get the same results if you just randomly sample again at. Last time I showed you about 30%, which means you would need somewhere in the order of about 24 sensors randomly selected to consistently do as well as you do here with the 10 that you picked, principal D. Here's another algorithm that Wilcox developed, and this is, uh, so it's just slightly different in how you pick these things. And the idea here is uh, looking at the sum of the diagonals uh, against the sum of the off diagonals and trying to basically pick locations in which it's more and more diagonal in structure. So not the condition number, but you're trying to remember that the idea is that I want, I want this M matrix, if I got a good measurement max, to look as diagonal as possible. And that's what this, this second algorithm does, is just tries to say, hey, let's try to make this look as diagonal as possible. So I will look at the sum of the diagonals against minus the sum of the off diagonals, right? And if I do that and just start picking locations, here's what you get. All right, so first of all, here's uh, now as we iterate forward, uh, here's the log of the error. You can see it starts to go down here. It doesn't do as well as the other, however, uh, and here's how the sensors come on. But again, another principled architecture, and this is now, this is the sum of what this is, this K2, kappa 2 is now, is this is actually looking at the sum of the diagonals minus the off diagonal. So as the off diagonals go to zero and the diagonals become big, then I, I start to go up this curve right here. Okay, so not as quite the same performance, uh, at least for this example, as picking the condition number, but it's also uh, a, a bit cheaper to run, right? Because you just take inner products and then just compute these sums versus doing the condition number, which requires you to do the SVD every time. Okay. So I would say this, the principal sampling is critical, especially in many applications where the number of interpolation points really matters. Uh, and so for every problem you look at, you have to really evaluate, can I get away with random sampling or is this random sampling still too big and I still want more reduction? Uh, if, if the random sampling uh, is cheap enough, in other words, you're still fairly small, then you're fine. You can just do randomness. But what this is really showing to you is a couple things. One, I can really reduce down to a minimal set the number of sensors by placing these things correctly. So that's a, a huge advantage to the principled sampling. Second, if I were to take a problem, and if I walk away from the reduced order modeling framework and just simply say, hey, I've got to minimize the number of sensors to, uh, to monitor some spatial temporal system, then principled sampling will allow you to take a smallest number of sensors possible so that you can still monitor the system accurately. Well, randomness will just say, well, just keep throwing more random sensors out there. Now, if sensors cost quite a bit or placing them is quite expensive, you do not want randomness, you'd want principled. Okay, so this is our first principled technique. We're gonna have a couple more coming up. Again, everything's out of the book, databook, uw.com. All the notes are there. The code I used to, to, I used to generate these plots is there, so you can just download everything and, and play around with some principled sampling.